I saw you admiring your own work there. <laughs> Not bad, this guy. Incredible, truly That's incredible. So <laughs> um, anyway, I'll, I'll leave the floor to you. Wow, this fast? Um, yeah, I was still in my, in my emotions here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. It's um, uh, an inspiration, as I said before, to uh, join young people, uh, young minds, new spirits, new ideas, future leaders, and um, exchange thoughts and uh, you know also get a bit of uh, your energy for uh, for my own own mission in life. So. Um, I'm not. I'm not uh, yet um, ready to go deeper into anything because I think that the interaction between ourselves is much better to get into, you know, the the evening. Um, so I'm I'm open for for questions. Uh, of course, we've enjoyed my uh, my career a bit, uh, which is always fun. Um, but I can anticipate that I won't be. Uh, responding uh, too much on, on football questions because I think we have more impo important matters to handle and to discuss tonight. Um, also because a lot of things you can find on the internet, a lot of those answers you can find on the internet. So, uh, let's not waste time on, on that. I think it's, uh, it's precious to be together. Um, I hope you hear me in the back, by the way. Yes? Good enough. But my voice is always very chill, so... <laughs> If it's if it's too <laughs> chill, then just shout, okay? <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I'm 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 here, and I'm um, more than happy to uh, to start uh, our exchange. Great, thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to start off with a few questions, and then we'll mm -hmm. throw it open to the audience to continue. And I mean, that's incredible. You've inspired so many millions of people worldwide. So I wanted to start off by asking you who your biggest inspirations in life have been, not just in football, but, but in life in general. Mm. Can I ask just one question? Maybe this is not um, your tradition, but I would like to see the people. So can we stand yeah. in front of the table? Should we, we, can, we can sit on the end of the table? Yeah, That's I, I would like that, yes. Uh, so you can ask the question again. So I wanted to ask who your greatest inspirations have yes. been, both in football and in life more generally. Yeah, I've, uh, let's say I've been very lucky to have um, both my parents still alive and um, they've been together during my whole, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, youth. And uh, they've played, of course, a major role in, in my, my development as, as a person uh, in my younger years. Uh, so for sure, Knowing that many don't have that opportunity uh, for one another reason, uh, I, I, I really, uh, uh, you know, uh, give great value to that. Uh, so my father, for sure, has been my f my first and, and greatest um, uh, idol, I would say, and, and inspiration. Uh, then I started understanding life a little bit better. Um, uh, there were some events when I was really young in Africa about the young kids that actually were dying from hunger and, and in Ethiopia. And I was seven or ten years around that time and actually that was the moment that I understood what my life mission was. So I, I said I'm, I'm very fortunate and lucky. I understood I wanted to give back. I wanted to give back to the younger people. I wanted to give back to uh, and, and help create a better world because for me that was just not acceptable. Um, of course you grow and I, I was thinking about building this huge house in Europe and bring all these kids to Europe, thought of a 10 year old. Later I um, understood that was a bit difficult. So uh, I had to <laughs> do it through other um, routes and, and um, uh, then, then the story of uh, Nelson Mandela came about and uh, he has been the greatest uh, inspiration uh, in my life, um, besides uh, my parents, as I said. Uh, his story as, and the story of all those uh, with him have um, given me the strength and the conviction and 
uh, you know, the will to, uh, to really consider that as my life mission to, uh, you know, add uh, for a better world and, and to, to make a contribution for a better world. Um, I was um, honored to uh, receive a um, request from Nelson Mandela to become one of the five legacy champions of his foundation to spread his message and to continue spreading his message around with Bill Clinton and, and Mr. Rockefeller. Um, uh, with other two uh, African uh, uh, people, which was a huge honor um, and also a great responsibility, but it was more than a responsibility, like a certificate from, okay, n now you can go and, and, and do your thing. Um, using my position, using football um, to, uh, to spread the message of peace, to spread the message of education, the importance of, you know, diversity and and so on and so on so that he was he was and is the man do you see that as your primary role now it's not as a former footballer or as a, as a former manager it's it's to go and spread the legacy of someone like Nelson Mandela well no it's 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 how we use what we do to spread the message constantly um, it's not that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, my coaching career has uh, started, uh, has been interrupted for a while, but soon we'll, uh, we'll start again. Um, and it's how do you do, and, I, I, and I, you just read it, what I, I wrote in, 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 in the book, and, and it's about when you wake up, uh, why do you wake up? What do you do that day? What, what is the reason of my existence? And... Um, when I ask uh, the question before, how many of you know what you want to do later when you're in 10 years or so? Can you raise your hand? How, how many of you know what you want to do? Who you want to become? What you want to become? I know. Who knows? So, and who is not so sure? Okay, well this, this is exactly, and which is not a good or a bad thing, this is just reality. This is what I see a lot around the world. Um, and it's completely normal and we should just go with the journey. Uh, as I said, I've, I've been fortunate uh, to, to know clearly what I want and, and how I want to achieve things. And um, I've been giving talent to, to play football. I've developed my talent. I, um, and I've used already um, you know, my position as a player to, to make the difference where I could. Um, as a coach, I want to do the same. I think that if we have, we just spoke with Adel Tarab by phone, and, and he is a huge idol for many Moroccan um, uh, people. And um, can you imagine if, if he can become uh, that player that he, he has in himself, um, what he could mean for the whole of Morocco? for the kids, the inspiration. That, that is why I was inspired to make sure that Adele be, you know, uh, could become uh, a better player and a better person. Um, he doesn't know it. He's not conscious of, of, of that. But it was my inspiration to make sure that he became more conscious, more aware of what he, his role is, you know, towards um, the youth, uh, especially in Morocco. So th this is, is how do we use our position to make a difference. Um, it's not just about selling uh, any product or, or just making money. That at the end is not the drive. It's never been my drive to have a new contract and earn millions and then every day I would think, okay, another million today or another 100,000 today. No, it's, it's not what gets me going. And uh, for sure it's not going to be, hopefully, what's going to get you guys going. So uh, there are many families that are depending on, you know, um, on their bosses and, and how do you treat the people. So all these elements that I deal with daily, um, and uh, that's, that's, that's my drive. Mm. That's my drive. And Adele was saying on the phone how he, he looks up to you as a real leader. And I was wondering, who's the greatest leader that you've seen in football? In football? In what sense? 
technical real social leader uh, because also that you know sometimes we see people being captain but they don't have social mm -hmm. skills um, sometimes they're just technical readers leaders uh, it it depends what you want to know I've, I've played with many great players uh, I've been fortunate enough to play in great clubs and with great teams and of course great personalities and um, more than than having seen uh, great individual leaders, I've seen uh, great human beings uh, who, who understood what it meant to be playing for a team and uh, who were capable of putting aside their own ego uh, because you can imagine that in Real Madrid and AC Milan of uh, Ajax of who have played all have an own agenda, mm -hmm. rightfully so. But to be able to win, you need to put aside your own agenda. There's no discussion about that, because there will be moments where you can fight for your own agenda, which is the moment you're going to discuss your contract. That's when you get try to get the best for yourself. But once that's done, it's all about the team. And uh, just to give an example of Paolo Maldini, who everybody, of course, um, would, would know, has played 25 years in AC Milan, and. Uh, the relationship that we have today is even better than when we were playing together. Um, we meet up, we go to dinner, we have dinner, we, we play tennis together, we, we speak about our, our, our kids and, and, and these things didn't happen really during our career because most of the times we lose ourselves a lot also in, in, in that objective of winning, uh, which is also beautiful because it means that the importance we give to our goal as a, the common goal is so big that that even the fa we become brothers, we become family almost. Uh, three quarter of the year we're together, we're more together uh, with the team than with our own families, and 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 that's why I say that it's um, so important to to have that focus on the group. That has the been been the biggest leadership and leadership that I've seen with all the champions uh, that I've played with. The capacity of really focusing on a group. How do you try and avoid that clash of personalities? Obviously, with the amazing clubs that you've played for, Real Madrid, Ajax, AC Milan, you've got so many leaders in one space. And Person how, how do you stop one person? Not leaders, personalities. personalities. Yes. A lot of personalities, a lot of characters, a lot of people with ego. Well, sometimes you just fight. <laughs> you have strong discussions and... Um, but everything has to be always to protect the common goal. Uh, that has been mostly my role, uh, which is not an easy role to play, because a lot of times you're the, the salmon going against the stream. Uh, when you see that some guys are not focused or their attitude can be harmful for the team, um, you will see that many won't say anything. You know, I'm seeing it, but I won't say anything. And I was just the guy that would be with my big mouth open and say, hey, you know, this is not how you do it. This is not how you should behave. Or and and, and um, Gattuso, for example, I will talk about Milan, which has been the longest period. Uh, maybe you guys have been able to follow that a little bit better. Gattuso was another guy who, who would say say when it was needed and, and then you would have the more um, silent guys like Pirlo. He would come to me and tell me what he thinks and then support me eventually if a discussion was out there. So again, all about how the team functions, how you know, we, we interact with each other. That for me is the most exciting thing of, of, of people management is we're all different. But if you can manage to, to relate to each other and, and respect each other, um, y y then you get a, a career as I had with all these champions. Yeah. And many would say it's, that's exactly how Leicester have done so amazingly, winning the Premier League. It's all those individuals putting together as a team in one kind of common effort. Um, but I imagine that one barrier to that is, is language. In lots of the teams you've played for, you've got lots of people who don't necessarily speak the same language. And how do you overcome that barrier? Well, it's not a barrier, it's an opportunity. 
it's the way of how you see, I mean, it's how you see it. As I said, diversity is such a powerful tool if you want to, if, if, you, if you look at it the right, right way. Um, if you see it as a barrier, then it can become an issue eventually. But um, all the teams I've played in were very diverse um, and that has strengthened the team. Um, also because the language was the ball, not, not, not the verbal language, but the, the common language which was the ball. And we understood that. And, and, and from there, you start having respect for each other. And from there, you start having also compassion and understanding and things grow out. And, and when difficult moments arise, then depending on the type of culture one half, um, they, they can make a contribution in a way that maybe um, just to give an example, Italians have a certain way of approaching the games very seriously uh, and they have to eat correctly and then you have the Brazilians that would eat like the pizza before the day if eventually. <laughs> they don't care. Um, but in difficult moments, it, that pizza mentality uh, that takes a bit away of the, the stress and the pressure and, and, and take things a little bit lighter because at the end we're talking about playing football, it's not that we're going into war. We're not, you know, um, so, so the differences, the differences um, in culture uh, add so much if you embrace it. You can overcome difficulties faster because each culture has um, its approach and some have a better and more efficient approach than others and so the more diverse you have. That's how the bigger companies, and I know you guys know it already, the most um, successful companies or the most diverse companies in, uh, in terms of minority, uh, ethnical minorities. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting how you say that in a football game, it's just a football game, you're not going into war. One thing that was remarkable about, about your career was how you only ever received two red cards and in, in the entirety of your career. Yeah, Do you think I'm, that's still I'm still pissed off with those two though. <laughs> 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 they were just... Do you think, it, is it because you, I mean, did you see yourself more as a role model to other members of the team or did you feel that you had more compassion with the, the, the team members on the other team that you didn't want to kind of do anything too reckless? How did you achieve that incredible feat? Can I be really honest? I wasn't needed. I had the ball all the time, so I mean, I didn't have to... <laughs> No, I mean, um, <laughs> what's a <your> joke? <laughs> <laughs> now, I got these two red cards, by the way. Um, they were really for free. I mean, in the one in Brazil, the referee wanted, uh, I was subbed, or actually, I, I needed to go off the field, and, and so was the number 10 come out. So I wanted to cross the field, which we all do in Europe, to go where the guy comes in. Um, just completely normal for me, culture. And all of a sudden, the referee says I had to go out on the other way and then walk around the field and go back. So I didn't understand it, you know. I said, but, I mean, what are you talking about? So I just started running and he called me back and gave me first yellow card. A and he wanted me really to go out to the other side and I was halfway already <laughs> to go there. <laughs> and um, so I still didn't get it and I still walked there and I, he gave me a second yellow card and that was the red card I got in Brazil. <laughs> now, maybe the language barrier was a problem there. Oh, no, no, there was no <laughs> language barrier. I was speaking with him and at the end there was a whole, uh, well, he, he was, um, how do you call it? Uh, I think he didn't had any game anymore that year because um, they saw the video and the exchange of words and he said that I said certain things which you could clearly see that I didn't say. Um, and he said that he, he, he gave me the second yellow card because I said something wrong to him, but it wasn't true. So I'm pissed off with that red card. <laughs> um, and the other red card was with AC Milan, the first one, one of the last games of the season. We were winning uh, against a smaller team and uh, I didn't see that somebody was on the ground. Um, so I just took the ball and started dribbling and I dribbled two of them and then um, I shot at goal. Uh, the goalkeeper took the ball and put it out and then they all came running to me and I said, what, what are you guys doing? I mean, yeah, did you see the guy there on the ground? I said, no, I didn't see him. So, I mean, okay, the referee was there with a bunch of people. I turned around and a guy hit me from the back in my face, just with a real hit. 
and any other normal human being probably would have hit him back. And so I pushed him back, knowing that I couldn't hit him. Of course, I would have loved to hit him, but <laughs> I couldn't. So I pushed him back, and uh, that cost uh, the second yellow card of the game. I had a yellow card during the game, and they gave me a second yellow card. And so that, that's how I came to my two red cards. So now you understand why I'm pissed off with it. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm actually, I'm a fair player. I was a fair player, I was tough. But um, I didn't, if I had white socks, I wanted to go after the game with white socks, if possible, back in the dressing room. This is just um, a metaphor. So I like, I like the aesthetics, I like uh, being clean. So when I when I entered in a, in a, in a uh, let's say in a one to one, I want to get the ball in a clean way. It's a mentality. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't looking for the for the legs. I wasn't looking for nothing else than the ball. Um, thinking like that uh, has avoided a lot of strange tackles and stuff. Um, and I think there are some other players that have really had a clean sheet. It's not easy, but it was a thousand games, more than a thousand games, so I'm, I'm proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> you should have tried playing in a suit and seeing if you could get that clean. Uh, the, the, the shoes are the problem, <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> um, did you ever experience racism in football? Sol Campbell has said that he would have been England captain um, if he wasn't a black person. And did you ever have any, of, any similar experiences to that? I probably had a very similar experience. I probably think he's right, um, but it's not a football issue. That's the part I don't agree about. I mean, it's it's uh, society still is full of uh, prejudice and, and racism and, and discrimination. Uh, you know, the minorities are still suffering everywhere in the world, unfortunately, um, and and it's up to us to make you know to change that. Um, I think football, sport, football can make a huge contribution to changing the perception of uh, diversity and, and making, giving a voice to the minorities. And because it's all, it's in your face, in football, it's all um, diverse. And, and it, it, it could be really a great example for how we can live together and how we can achieve things together using the sports. But then we talk about communication. So it needs to be communicated better and my activity, for example, with UEFA as a global ambassador for diversity and change yeah, is, is focused on that. It's focused on, on the message we, we spread, focused on how we can use football to tackle social issues and um, uh, racism. One of the things, I don't know who's interested in communication, is somebody here studying communication in general? No. Okay, then we can skip that part, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I think it's important as we all watch television um, and have an impression of, of what we see. We all um, <coughs> have an opinion of what we see. And if I look at the NBA, then I see um, a lot of positive role models. I see a lot of positive social initiatives by the NBA. I see quality. I see a very nice product. I see inspir inspirational um, uh, moments. I see awareness that, that gives something back to the fans, to the people on the street. When I see football, then we have, until a few months ago, talked about all the corruption that goes on. We talk about you know, um, players that can still try to cheat and get away with it in the field. We can get all kinds of behaviors on and off the field, which is not coherent with the sport values. But this is what we're communicating. Because let's say that, especially on the field, I would say more than 90% of the things are positive. The exchange between uh, one player and another and the opponent are positive. You know, they're shaking hands and they're, but the people who are behind and who are, you know, with the cameras and everything, they need to be more aware of what they show. And I think that probably uh, FIFA, UEFA, all the governing bodies should step up and, 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 and make, um, let's say, ma yeah, make, make some changes in that and, and make sure that the message that, that, that is sent is a more positive one, is more transparent and 
and with the, the, the values that sport, you know, uh, embraces. Thank you. Before my posture gets even worse sitting here on this table, uh, we're going to open up to questions from the audience. And let's start, please, with the question from the gentleman in the aisle. Um, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing young Africans nowadays? And do you think football can help alleviate or um, just solve some of them? And you talk about all Africa, yes. the whole of Africa. Africa um, has an incredible potential for sure, but the problems are bigger than football. Um, again, also there, I think sports, football can help, can give you know the young an opportunity to stay off the streets. Um, we all know that sports in the development of the early ages of, of a kid is, is fundamental for their psychological and mental development and, and um, they, that's, that's where I think that football and, and sports in general can make a great contribution. Um, so creating sport facilities, creating sport activities, uh, education, life skills, um, uh, programs which can definitely be a, a life changer for them. So the NGOs and, and uh, the organizations, the institutions of football and other sports should invest more in that to contrast a little bit what the political uh, situations are generally uh, complicate for these uh, youngsters. Yeah. Thank you. Can we go please to the, uh, the question just next to you, Kriti? Yeah. Uh, sorry. <coughs> Thank you very much for coming first. Um, my, one of my first memories of football really was the 2005 final in Istanbul. Uh, and I was just wondering, what was the yeah. atmosphere in the Milan dressing room at half time? Uh, and would you say the second half was down to Liverpool's genius or, or Milan's complacency? Yeah, are we going to concede the football question? We're going to concede uh, the football to question. <laughs> Maybe one or two. And he picked exactly that moment. That is, he is a guy with courage, I'm sure. Um, no, I, we were super focused and we, went, we entered the second half creating chances. Uh, I think the, the goalkeeper made a save on, on the line like after five minutes in the second half to make the 4-0. And after that, I think it was just destiny. It was Liverpool's time. We played one of the best finals ever seen in the last 20 years. Um, had to be like that. In six, six minutes, three goals in the final. I mean, what, what to say? <laughs> Thank you. Let's go to the question right at the back on my left-hand side. Um, I was wondering, you're talking about your future, I was wondering what it is that you want to do with the rest of your life, your life goal. You talked about like making the world a better place, but what like, so what's the future, what's the vision that you do for that? Okay, well, the vision is to use every, um, all of my interests and activities to, uh, to make a contribution, directly or indirectly. Um, I have business interests, uh, in sports um, and, and also personally as a philanthropist, you know, going around the world making my contributions with my foundation or other foundations. Um, so that's my guideline, uh, but I'm, I'm not, I cannot see the future, so I don't know what's coming. The only thing I can do is try to recognize the signals, try to recognize what's coming on my path and, and try to grab those situations that I think can, uh, yeah, can add to what, what I want to achieve. And again, it's not about me, it's, not a, it's, it's, it's about um, me as a tool with all the people around me that, that, that want the same, uh, trying to make a difference. I, I don't know even where I'm going to be coaching next year, so to give you an understanding. It may be here in, here in England, it can be in Russia, maybe in China, I don't know. But for sure, the way I'm going to be coaching is, is with a certain philosophy. Uh, and, and for sure, changing some, some of the elements that, that we spoke about before. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the question on the other side at the back. 
Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Just a question, I guess, which links some of the themes in the talk. Um, and you talk about, say, your future in coaching. Uh, there's a dearth of sort of ethnic minority managers in British football. Um, so I was just wondering if you could talk perhaps a bit about uh, the Dutch football system and they, the way it encourages, say, former players to come through into management and perhaps how you'd suggest we may tackle this problem in Britain. Well, it's not only a Britain problem, I think it's uh, much broader. Um, it seems all quite uh, uh, strange to say, but, but, but football has, is living a, a moment of change. Every, everyone is looking to, in Holland, they're looking to improve the game again and to make new projects and new methods to, to find young talent and to uh, develop young talent. Um, here in Britain, uh, there's there's no black coach uh, in the Premier League, um, uh, and and well, I will give you a few numbers. Um, this is all research done by universities together with UEFA, and um, only well less than five percent of minorities involved in the top management in all the institutions of football in Europe, and in all the benches as coaches. That's the situation where we are. So talking about the racism and the discrimination and all, this, these are the figures. So there's a lot, a lot to do. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the, the British um, coaches, the interest and the system, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If they really want to make a difference, um, there are so many countries who are great developers of coaches that they can just copy it if they want. So it's, it's, it's a question of who's leading there and why uh, aren't things better today for the British coaches. They should, I think you could probably answer that better than, than me because it has to be a political issue. It doesn't make any sense. France, Holland, Germany, I mean they have all developed great coaches over the years to just give a few ideas. Thank you. Let's go to the question on the front row over here. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for coming. I have a question concerning natural talent. To what extent do you think natural talent affects performance? I mean, if you suppose you take two people and they put the same amount of training, to what extent do you think that would eventually reflect on their performance being different? I mean, to what extent are you born to be that good? Yeah, well, if the. Can you imagine if Maradona would have been training the same as Gattuso? <laughs> <laughs> he would have been like untouchable effort, you know. I think that who has raw talent and, and puts the same effort in developing that talent, uh, there's no competition with the one who doesn't have that talent. I mean, will improve his game, but never become as good. What do you think makes him that talented? It, does it come down to genes? Uh, definitely. Yeah, we're just some we're just born with with well, that's talent. Talent is what you were born with, and I think everybody has talent in one way, uh, uh, and a lot only really recognize their own talent in a later age. All the hands that were up there, maybe there's still space because you don't really know what your real talent is. Um, and that's the journey we need to, to go. That's, that's why life is beautiful. I think that's why we explore and, and we try and we do something and we study this and we study that. We do this job, we do that job until we find ourselves. Not, not many are as lucky as I've been to, to understand and also be able to um, have a job that is actually a hobby, which is, I mean, it was never a job for me. So how lucky can one be? <coughs> But on the other hand, it's also fantastic to be able to have that journey and to explore things and to get to know yourself and, and then finally, hey, this, this is what I want. This is who I am. This is, and, and that's the thing I, I generally say, try to stick as close as possible to yourself. You won't go you know, far from being um, right uh, about you know, what your real talent is. But for sure, and I've been with many, many talents. When the talent doesn't really work on its talent, generally they don't make it. And the guy that doesn't have talent, and he works hard, 
makes it. That, is, that has been generally what I've seen in sports and in life, yeah. Thank you. Obviously a large part of it is that you have to have natural talent, but to a large extent it's also about the training and how you are nurtured when you're young. And to become a professional sports person nowadays, you have to start training when you're so young, often sacrificing academic studies, other activities. You made your debut for Ajax when you were 16. Do you think it's ethical to start training people at such a young age and to kind of pigeonhole them and say, this is what you're going to do, you're going to sacrifice everything else and focus on your sports career? Well, it was never really a choice to um, not study with uh, Ajax. Actually, if you didn't study well, you weren't playing. So, um, I think they can go hand in hand. Uh, I think the American um, system is a perfect example of how sports can be completely integrated into the school system and educational system. Um, it's the will. Where you're right is that um, once the young players reach the first team and they have the contract, that's where this is where I think things should, sh should change. Um, I made a proposal to um, oblige all the, the clubs to continue at least for three years um, the courses for the players, for the talents. They should not stop studying. And I think that if you... Um, because we have a lot of time, you know, who asked me about the PlayStation? Was it you? Probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if we can play PlayStation, we can also study, correct. We're traveling a lot, um, that's true. Physically, it's not easy because when you're exhausted physically, it's hard to then also be studying with your books. We all know that, but on the other hand, we can still find our time. And, and um, nobody told me to continue study, so I didn't. But then 10 years later, I actually wanted to study again. I started my courses again. But this was because of myself, because of some people that inspired me to, to do so again. But I, I think that the system should oblige, oblige the, the, the clubs to continue support and, and, and um, you know, uh, ask from, from those young talents to continue studying in something they like. Just the fact of being being with the books and, and being in that chair um, gives another perspective also to life and, and another understanding. <laughs> and I think that would change also the level of players that when they end their career, ending up in depression and ending up um, without any money or just huge problems uh, in general. Because when you stop learning at such a young age, it's, it's just too young to not have any development anymore um, uh, from, from, you know, with your brains. I mean, you need to use your brains. Mm. Thank you. Let's go for another audience question. Let's go to the gentleman in the aisle. Uh, thanks for your talk so far. Um, just wondering, like, you seem very uh, selfless in your outlook, uh, whereas a lot of professional sports people are notoriously egoistic. Um, you've talked about your, your life mission being to improve the lives of others. Um, how much do you think that all of us should look out for ourselves? And how much do you think that that should actually be kind of subsumed within a greater goal for doing good for others? Or do you think, which do you think should come first? Or do you think one can work for the yeah, other? Yeah, this is, this is a great philosophy. I mean, I think e e each of you guys have, have developed a philosophy uh, until now. Um, I believe that you need to take care of yourself first. Because how can you take care of others if you don't take care of yourself? How can you love others if you don't love yourself? How can you um, understand others if you don't understand yourself? If it's the other way around, it means that something eventually, I reckon, is missing within yourself because it means that you are, um, and many people do that. I've always said, I need to be okay so I can give. So there are certain moments that you need to make that choice. But generally, with a contradiction, generally you're giving. 
most of my time I'm spending um, to be with others, to be there for others, but I need to regenerate myself too. And in those moments I need to take care of myself. Thank you. Let's go to the question uh, from the gentleman towards the back on the right hand side. Hi Clarence. Um, I just want to ask you, how did you feel uh, and how have you decided when was the moment to stop your career, to say, okay, I won't be anymore a football player? How you, was it difficult? I didn't even have the time to think about if it was difficult or not because I, I stopped one day and two days later I was on the bench in AC Milan. In between I had the flight from Brazil to Milan and there was more or less 11, 12 hours. So no, I didn't really have the time to think about it. But I thought about it before, let's say years before. Um, I, I expressed before how many players actually end up their career and then get into depression because they've never thought about it. It's completely different. My life today, I've been messed up for a year because I didn't have any, uh, no schedule, no nothing, to, nobody telling me that I had to train, when to eat, when to go to, okay. Um, so I, <laughs> and so I, I actually, uh, had a completely new life. Um, I was more home, which was also different. Um, but I prepared myself mentally before. I was always, as I said, thinking about this football was part of life. I, I had other interests. Um, I had my restaurants business, I had my um, sports businesses, uh, activities, as I said, I, I travel around the world. That has helped me in that year to fill the gap. Um, the only problem I had, unfortunately, um, I found a way quickly because I like to do sport activities and not having the facility available every day freaked me out. Really freaked me out. And, and you start eating at certain times that you weren't used to. And I was quite, you know, uh, disciplined and, and regular. I couldn't be regular anymore. So, this is what they go through when they stop playing and the ones who have not prepared themselves a little bit mentally just lose it for many many years and um, uh, that's a pity um, i will write a book about it because i think it's not necessary um, and uh, but not for the ones who are stopping for the youngsters who are coming up Continue studying continue and think that every day is a day that you need to thank God who believes or at least acknowledge that you can be injured and you can be injured in a way that you cannot play anymore. And what is plan B? Do you have a plan B? Think about the plan B. Maybe you never use it, but everybody needs to have a plan B. If you're a cook, and you go and play tennis, you can break your, your arm, you can hurt yourself, you can break a finger, whatever. Think about it. What happens if you cannot use your you know, main physical tool um, to express your talent? And obviously in football, sometimes it's often out of choice. You, when you get to 40, you have to retire, or you get an injury, you have to retire and have a, a career change. Do you think that more generally in life, is it important for people to do different things, to do one thing for Sorry. 20 years and then to do something else to keep themselves alive and fresh? Uh, well, it helped me to have, uh, sorry, to have other um, activities going on, interests, actually developing my other interests and talents, exploring them. Um, I think that's very important to acknowledge <laughs> your other interests um, responsibly. Mm. It should not take away from your core business, your core activity, but um, it can add because it, when you're only focused on one thing at the end you don't see so clear anymore but if you then maybe focus on something else then all of a sudden hey idea come back and then you can make it happen again and, and, and create. So yeah I think to be creative it's good to have uh, different initiatives and activities. Great, we'll go for one final question uh, on this side of the room. Thanks for the talk, Clarence. Um, you've spoken a bit about leadership and I wondered um, 
What were the best examples of good leadership, possibly from managers in your career that you've learned from and you also think that would be applicable to us potentially not in football? Well, let's talk about you guys. You like that? Oh, no. Um, this is another thing. When you ask a question, you get a response. I said, you like it? You said yes or no. I would like to know whether you like if I'm going to talk about you. Yes? Because I like to talk about you guys. <laughs> Much more than talk about the coaches I've had. Um, because it's about you guys. You, you are the future leaders of tomorrow. You, you will make a difference eventually how you treat your colleague, how you treat your employee. How are you going to do that? Are you going to be the bitchy boss or are you going to be a gentle boss? Are you going to be an inspiring boss? Are you going to be somebody who empowers others? Because at the end, everything that we produce comes back to being a human being. And um, they will make the difference. And, and I think that this is the leadership that I'm talking, this is the leadership I talk about. Do we empower people or do you work on fear? Do I encourage people to be creative or do I kill their creativity because I want to control everything? Do I delegate or always come and check everything? These are the choices that you should, you should be, be um, thinking about your philosophy. How are you going to be what you're going to be? And how are you going to act with other people? Because of people, it doesn't matter whether you're their boss or whether you have a boss who is that bitchy boss. Challenge him or her. Don't accept that because um, it takes away from yourself. And I've always done it. It's nef not always been easy, not always been accepted. I've done it with respect. You can challenge your boss with respect. You can challenge authority with respect because you have self-respect. And that's, that's the leadership is, 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 for me, fundamentally respecting others and um, being there for the others, taking care of their needs. Um, they know they can count on you, you know, um, and then you are individuals, uh, everyone in a different way. Um, so you cannot just generalize it but follow a certain path that is a positive one, that's empower an empowering one to others. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all we have time for this evening. Could you please all join me in thanking, once again, Clarence Seedorf. <laughs> <laughs>